Welcome to Walking with Jesus. This is episode 75. Today we're going to be taking a look at Mark chapter 15, verses 21 through 32. Our topic for today is the crucifixion. All right, let's dive right in. A passerby named Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the countryside just then. The soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus, and they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. They offered him wine drugged with myrrh, but he refused it. Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. They divided his clothes and threw dice to decide who would get each piece. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. A sign announced the charge against him. It read, the king of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Ha, look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to, betray, to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priests and teachers of religious law also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this king, of, this king of Israel, come down from the cross so we can see it and believe in him. Even the people who were crucified with Jesus ridiculed him. Obviously, for those of us who have made the decision to follow Jesus, this is one of the most powerful and impactful moments that we come across in all the scriptures, where Jesus is officially laid upon the cross and the this, this sin of humanity falls upon him in its full weight and destruction. There are several things in this passage that I, I think are important for us to understand, so I want to dig through them a little bit here, piece by piece. I always find it interesting that this man Siren, Simon from Cyrene is chosen out of the crowd. The reason that this is important is because we see here that Jesus in his humanity is at his physical breaking point. They have torn the flesh from his body. They have beaten him, ridiculed, mocked him, shoved a crown of thorns upon his brow. And Jesus has reached a place of physical exhaustion. The Romans, as part of your punishment and torture, caused you to carry your cross. Now, the place that they had them carry it was to a, a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. Many believe that it was called that because the hill actually resembled a skull. There are actually two places currently in Jerusalem that are argued about by scholars that could be the potential location of Golgotha. Both of them have this kind of reminiscent feature of a, a skull, and that's after 2,000 years of weathering. Either way, we know that Jesus was carrying his cross and the weight of it and the difficulty of the physicality part was too much. So they picked someone randomly and this was something that Romans were known to do. They would choose a non-Roman and, and have them participate in this activity. And so Siren of Cyrene helps carry this gives us another detail that they offered Jesus wine mixed with myrrh or drugged with myrrh, and this was to, uh, to, to help with the pain. But Jesus refused. Now, I personally believe that Jesus refused this wine mixed with myrrh because he was determined to face the full weight and responsibility of humanity's sin. He was not going to take an easy way out. Then it tells us that the soldiers nailed him to the cross. Now, I don't want to get graphic for the sake of graphic, but I do believe it's important for us to understand some of the historical significance of these details uh, because it should just remind us how much love Jesus has for us. Crucifixion was created by the Romans to be an extremely excruciating form of torture. Um, it was part of their preventative measures because people knew how bad of a death crucifixion truly was. 
So what they would do is they would take a large metal spike, usually about nine inches in length, maybe a half inch in diameter, and uh, they would ram it through your wrists and also through your ankle bones. Now, the only way that you could get a breath while on the cross would be to pull yourself up, putting weight against the bone in your wrist, especially in your ankles. Now, while you're hanging there for hours on a t at a time, your lungs begin to fill with fluid. Your lungs begin to fill with a mixture of blood and, and water as your body begins to slowly shut down and its processes are no longer working. So what actually killed you in crucifixion was not blood loss, but you actually asphyxiated or you drowned in your own internal fluids as you became too weak to lift yourself up in a way that your lungs could function properly. And eventually without oxygen, your heart would give out and you would die. Now to speed this along, we might read about this in the, uh, the next section, they would actually break the legs after a certain amount of hours so that the individuals would not even be able to press up so that it would hasten their death. So here Jesus is upon the cross and the physical aspect of this is bad enough, right? Because his body has been shredded at this point. So even whenever he is pulling himself to breathe, all of that open skin, those open nerve endings are rubbing against that rough wooden cross. In the midst of this, all of the sin of humanity is laid upon him. You know, crucifixion is bad enough to die that way, but it was the sin that weighed him down. It was the ramification, the consequences of every bad decision ever made by every human being, past, present, and future, that were laid on him in that moment. And it actually caused a, a moment of separation between him and the Father. But in the midst of all of this, life is going on around him. The Roman soldiers are casting dice for his clothing. Now this is interesting for two reasons. The first reason it's interesting is a lot of people think that Jesus walked around in complete poverty. Well, I understand why people would think that. I mean, he uh, didn't have a home of his own. He was an itinerant rabbi, which means he was traveling around and really relying upon others to provide for him. However, as a rabbi, you know, he, he had a, a large group of people following him and they actually had money, a reserve of, of money. They had a treasurer who was ironically Judas. And the garment that Jesus was wearing, it was a costly garment. It was worth enough that the Roman soldiers were actually playing dice to determine who would acquire this garment. So the other piece that's interesting is that this is something that had been prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. That when the Messiah died, that, that soldiers would cast dice for his clothing. So it's nine o'clock in the morning when this occurs. So um, this, the events that we've been reading about and talking about over the last several episodes, they've been going on for about 12 hours. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus' arrest, his trial before Pilate, um, his beating by the soldiers, and now finally his crucifixion. Above his head, there's a sign, and it says, King of the Jews. Now, this was the official charge against him because again, you have to remember, you can't be a king if there's an emperor. So anybody who called himself a king was seen to be in direct opposition to Caesar. They wrote this in three languages, in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, and they placed it above his head on the cross. Golgotha was, at, was set upon a hill and it was at the intersection of a major thoroughfare. So there were a lot of people who would be traveling back and forth from the city of Jerusalem who would see this. And the reason that the Romans did it there was because they wanted people to see 
what happened when you messed with Rome. As, as Jesus is hanging there, they crucify two revolutionaries side beside him. These are men who had committed murder, who had probably committed other sinful atrocities. And so Jesus' companions, as he is dying in his perfection for our sin, is other sinners. But the people that were passing by, they did not feel sorry for him. There was no remorse or compassion. These people hurled insults. And you have to remember that these are likely the same people who were shouting for joy when Jesus walked into Jerusalem just a, just a few days earlier when he rode in on the donkey and they were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Well, the reason that they had turned on him so vehemently was because their expectations of who he was and what he was going to do had been shattered when he was arrested by the Romans. They thought he was the conquering king. They thought he was coming as a Messiah and that he was going to reestablish the kingdom. And so now that their hopes had been dashed, their hearts become hardened, and they begin to shout insults and mockery and their anger and their frustration. They loved him when he was living up to their expectations. They despised him when those expectations did not come to fruition. How often do we treat God like that? How often do we enjoy praise and worship, reading our Bibles and prayer, fellowship and serving, when everything is going the way we think it should go? But how quick are we to turn our backs on God, on His goodness and on His love and His mercy, when we face difficulty and our expectations don't line up with our reality? The priests and the teachers of the religious law, they also come and they just add insult to injury. And they begin to say things like, hey, if this really was the Messiah, if this really was the King of Israel, He could come down off that cross. You know, He spent so much time talking about how He could save others, but He could not even save Himself. And it says, even the men that were crucified beside Him who were dying in the same capacity that he was, they were also ridiculing and mocking him. Who was filling these people's mouths with the words that they were saying? Who was it? It was Satan. It was Satan and his legion of demons. They were sitting on the shoulders of these people, whispering in their ears, planting thoughts and seeds in their minds to say these things because that's all Satan has is accusation and insult. But He will hit us with thoughts and words to hurt us in our most vulnerable and weakest moments. That, that's what He was trying to do. He was trying to break Jesus. The reality of it is, Jesus was accomplishing exactly what He set out to do. He was accomplishing exactly what He intended. He was fulfilling His purpose. Jesus came to save us from our sins. The only way that He could save us from our sins was by becoming a human being, to face what we face, to live as we live, but to overcome sin by living perfectly and fulfilling the law, and then by becoming a sacrifice on our behalf to wash away our sins in His own blood. Jesus dies. He rises from the grave three days later. We're going to read about this. And then He ascends to heaven. Jesus is coming back. When Jesus comes back the next time, all of those other expectations are going to be fulfilled then. When He comes back the next time, He's going to reveal the full extent of His glory and of His power. We have a decision to make now to prepare ourselves and ready our hearts for when Jesus comes back the next time, will we, re- will we be ready to receive Him? Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I ask You, Lord, that You would help us to understand the magnitude 
of what happened on the cross. Help us, Lord, not to read over these words too lightly, but I pray that the weight of them would stick with us and we would recognize the great extent of Your love and Your compassion and Your mercy for us. Help us, Jesus, to cling to You. Help us to trust in You that You alone would be our source of hope because You gave everything on our behalf. We give You everything that we have. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, I pray that God's Word